Please be seated, everyone. Veuillez vous asseoir, Votre Excellence. Je vous cède la parole. Nous sommes prêts. Allons-y, hein? As I look out, I say never has so much talent been gathered in one place since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> what a delight it is to be here. So I was coming into this place, Robert Salter Auditorium. I don't know how many of you know, knew Bob Salter, an extraordinary physician surgeon, someone who was a, a great pillar of the Order of Canada. The Order of Canada's motto is, they desire a better country. Bob Salter works so much to create that better country. In this remarkable place, Sick Children's Hospital, Sick Children's Teaching and Learning Center, renowned rightfully around the world. I suppose people here wouldn't say probably, I'd say probably uh, the best emporium of uh, learning and clinical care about children in the world. And what was going through my mind was that question that John Gardner used to pose, can we have equality of opportunity and excellence too? Can any society, community, etc., have those two objectives as ones that reinforce one another rather than ones that are disjunctive and one may, must make an either or choice? Can it be both and? And it's institutions like this that reaffirm that yes, we can have equality of opportunity and excellence too. This place that treats children from every walk of life across this country, and this place that has so much excellence per square inch or per uh, cubic inch of intellectual capital is simply remarkable in doing both of those things so very well. And that's a great statement about Canada, isn't it? That we can have the both ends. It's a great statement about the smart and caring nation, that uh, that's what we're about. And that's this great experiment, which is Canada, the idea of Canada, a place that is inclusive, uh, where equality of opportunity and excellence, too, go hand in hand. And I'm departing from my notes here, and my colleagues are getting very annoyed with me because they like me to stick to my notes, but I'm having some fun with the preamble, so bear with me. You know, it, at its most fundamental, <clears throat> it's how one builds healthy societies. Uh, I read a lot, and one of my awkward habits is that um, when I find a book that has some new ideas, I buy half a dozen or a dozen copies, and I distribute them to my colleagues. And they say, I better read it, because as sure as God made little green apples, he'll be asking me about it next week. <laughs> but one of them is a book um, called uh, Why Nations Fail. Um, and it's by James Robinson, a political science a scientist at Harvard and Dan Mistiglou, a, a equivalent at MIT. And there's a wonderful Canadian connection. The book comes out of the um, Global Economic Society Project of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, started by another great Bob Salter, like Canadian Fraser Mustard, now going into its 30th year or so on. And what they say is those societies that thrive and succeed are inclusive in their economics and their politics. And those that go in the downward spiral are extractive in their economics and their politics. And it's filled with examples from ancient Babylon right through to the modern day, one being Korea, a peninsula which was somewhat united in 1952, but was divided in half, and two societies went different directions. And it's a pretty interesting case, society, case example of what happens with inclusive and extractive societies. One of the beauties of this job is you meet people that you find stimulating, fascinating. Meeting some months ago with Chancellor Merkel of Germany, a very interesting person, a research chemist before she went into politics. And we were having a one-on-one -on -one with some of our colleagues around us. and. Uh, I, like a child in a candy store, ever the schoolboy interested in ideas, kept cross-examining her on whether the European Union that had won a Nobel Prize just a year or so before for peace. And just imagine, for six decades, Europe was without war. It's been some periods in history where we've seen that. And she, equally curious, was cross-examining me on how this crazy quilt country, Canada, works. How can you have so much diversity, so much, quote, chaos, and bring unity and order out of it? And in searching for a simple answer, I quoted uh, 
the book Why Nations Fail, of inclusivity on the plus side and extraction on the downside. And I was explaining that it's not inclusive and exclusive, which is 180 degree depart. It's more like 145 degree depart. Her English was, is very good, but she switched into German for about five minutes. And with her colleagues, they came up with about 16 different synonyms for the word exclusive, extractive, I'm sorry, extractive in German. It was a fascinating discussion. And it reinforced in me the importance of this, the idea of Canada. What is distinctive about this place? What is the effort that we are making in our journey to build a community that has substance and has uh, hope uh, and has promise for the next generation? And I think that notion of inclusivity versus extractiveness is a key to it. And I think that answer of we can have equality of opportunity and excellence too is an answer to it. And we see it in this institution. This is excellence at the very, very pinnacle, and it's a quality of opportunity as well. And of course, all of you represent important features of the Canadian community that do just that very thing. Day by day, build healthier, more inclusive communities where we can have equality of opportunity and excellence too. And now to my address. I'm delighted to be here. Um, we have a fair number of invitations that come in and have to make decisions about what one does and where one spends one's time. Uh, this is one of those ones that I just leap to because I identify so much with what you do as professionals every day. You are people who share the same fundamental goal and that's to strengthen this country's charitable sector and in so doing help those who need it most. <coughs> As you know, and from that very delightful introduction of me you heard a moment ago, a more caring, more generous nation is among my biggest hopes for Canada. And over the past few years, we've had the occasion to meet and work with so many volunteers and charitable sector professionals, many of you in this room and, of course, the people that you represent so well. And so if you remember nothing of what I say today, just remember two words, thank you. And if you can comprehend something a little bit longer than that, let me say Canada has benefited richly from the contributions of the many professionals, volunteers, and philanthropists who dedicate themselves to helping others. And uh, I'm very much one of you. I was a university president for 27 years, and you know they are the most uh, draconian, uh, ruthless, uh, predatory fundraisers that ever graced the face of the world. <laughs> My friend Rob Pritchard, Rob was a student of mine, we were together, he was Toronto, I was McGill, and we're in Falconer Hall, which is uh, the law faculty where I was a professor and Rob was a law student. And uh, you know, I said, Rob, we really have come full circle, aren't we? <laughs> we're here in Falconer Hall, the Falcon, that's a bird of prey, we're university presidents, we're very much at home. So let me again say thank you for what you do every day on behalf of all Canadians. And let me also show you some respect by keeping my remarks brief, having already uh, contravened that injunction in my preamble, um, so that we have some time for questions. Uh, I'm often reminded of my marvelous grandmother who used to say, stand up to be seen, speak up to be heard, and sit down to be appreciated. This is a good place to begin remarks on leadership, which I'll follow up by sharing with you some of what we've been up to at Rideau Hall of Date, and I, I'd like to be able to describe that because uh, you are our partners in that endeavor. And then I want to end by looking ahead to 2017 when we celebrate Canada's 150th birthday, a wonderful opportunity to invigorate the climate of giving in this country, because when you think about birthday parties, you usually bring a gift. So we should ask each Canadian, what is your gift to Canada at our 150th birthday, which will take us for another 20 or 40 or 150 years into the future. But let me lead with leadership. À mon avis, pour diriger et gérer le plus efficacement possible, il faut reconnaître sa dépendance totale à l'égard de son entourage. Voilà une attitude avertie et bienveillante. Voilà le seul moyen véritablement efficace et légitime de diriger du personnel au 21e siècle. C'est bien simple. Les méthodes de gestion axées sur le commandement et le contrôle sont maintenant choses du passé. 
In my view, leadership and high performance management means recognizing your total dependence on the people around you. I often quote that. Leadership means recognizing your total dependence on the people around you. And like Chancellor Merkel's 15 or 16 or 17 synonyms for the word extractive, there are many leanings of that particular concept, your total dependence on the people around you. Because of course you choose them and you reinforce them and you encourage them every day. That's both smart and caring. And I think it's the only truly effective and legitimate means of leading people in the 21st century because quite simply, command and control methods of management are now passe. This shift has been taking place since at least the First World War when the top-down approach to leadership was so thoroughly discredited by the appalling loss of human life. Over 440,000 Canadians died in that war and four or five times that number were casualties, about one-tenth of our total population. Extraordinary uh, set of uh, really tragic consequences. On occasion, we will have a solemn duty of remembering this year, the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of that terrible war. But continuing with this scene, let me share a notable example of enlightened leadership from the very same conflict, the famous Battle of Vimy Ridge. It's one that should be, the story of Vimy Ridge should be told in every school from grade one on. I have a particular affinity for it because I had the great privilege of being the principal and vice chancellor at McGill University and Sir Arthur Curry, the first Canadian to lead Canadian troops at that Vimy Ridge battle, became the principal of McGill University shortly after the war. Many books have been written about Vimy and the reasons for the success of Canadian troops there. The French and the English had battled with the Germans for about a year with terrible casualties on both sides for inches of terrain without success, and the Canadians won Vimy uh, in about three days. But let me focus on just one important difference between that battle and those terrible ones that preceded it. For the first time, maps were given to all troops. Maps were given to all troops, rather than solely to the senior officers. This allowed soldiers to better understand the terrain, to imagine their goal, and to improvise when necessary. And in modern management terms, we think of this as placing trust in employees to use their intuition in adjusting to circumstances and achieving goals. I was in London two days ago and fond of quoting my friend Mark Carney, who we have temporarily exported for five years and then we'll bring him home. Mark, about trust, said trust comes in on foot and goes out in a Ferrari. It took a little time for the English audience two days ago to realize that. And my colleague Stephen Wallace said, well, don't you understand? You should have said Bentley or Aston Martin, not Ferrari. That's an Italian car. Let me extend this collaboration that we saw so evidently in the privates and the corporals carrying maps of the battle scene. And they actually had the battle plan so that they could improvise when necessary at Vimy. Let me extend this collaboration metaphor beyond those who work within your own organizations, outward to your communities, to the country, and to the world at large. In my time as Governor General and in my previous experience as a university manager, about which I'll be happy to answer questions later, the most privileged position on earth to be a general manager of a learning institution where the students are so bright that even I couldn't do any damage to them and where every day people are coming up with wonderful ideas and putting them to work. One of the constant prerequisites of success has been the willingness to reach out and form partnerships. Whatever the goal, working with others has always been important to success, but the necessity of collaboration is particularly urgent in today's rapidly changing interconnected world. It's interesting to me to note how globalization and the ongoing information and communication revolution both enable us and require us to work together and to forge partnerships. It's almost as if because we can communicate and collaborate with one another, we must. It's a bit of a perverse reversal of uh, ordinary laws of human interaction. This is particularly important when we share the same goals, for example, to inspire a smarter, more caring nation or to fulfill the obligations of the Order of Canada. They desire a better country. The challenges and complexity of the task at hand are such that we are far better off when we pool our efforts and our ingenuity. 
Time and time in my life and work, I've found that collaboration builds social capital and fosters innovation. It brings new ideas to bear. And so let me share with you an experiment in collaboration and innovation that we're presently undertaking at Rideau Hall. It's called the Rideau Hall Foundation, which we created last year as an independent, non-political meeting place where Canadians can work together in common cause. And it came from the fundamental mission statement of Rideau Hall, which is to connect, honor, and inspire Canadians. The foundation will help to amplify the scope and the reach of the Office of the Governor General, enabling us to cultivate initiatives that foster Canadian sense of values and identity, increase Canada's potential for excellence, and strengthen our efforts to build a better country. Again, a basic purpose of the office is to connect, honor, and inspire Canadians, and in so doing, to reinforce the most fundamental positive values of being Canadian, some of the things I spoke about when I came in a few moments ago. Two of the Foundation's initial projects are, one, it's an honor, and that's a mobile exhibit on the Canadian system of honors that's currently traveling to, small, to schools, community centers, and small towns across the country so that everyone, particularly young people, can learn about our Canadian heroes, be they members of the Order of Canada, be they people who have won the Victoria Cross, bravery, courage, community effort, etc. The idea is to encourage and motivate Canadians by sharing stories of extraordinary achievement, such as bravery, service, and compassion. And one of the wonderful things about this exhibit, it, it is literally extending the reach of our office, bringing our messages to people in their own communities right across Canada. And what we find is, in a sense, the smaller the community, the greater magnitude and amplitude of the light, that smaller communities are particularly interested uh, in what their citizens are doing to build better communities. And very often, the beauty of this honor system is it takes the unsung heroes who have worked away nobly in a particular cause, never looking for any attention, and all of a sudden, a light has shined out and the community says, my heavens, that happened because so-and-so has been working on that for 10 or 15 or 20 years. Another project currently being undertaken by the Rita Hall Foundation is called My Giving Moment, a campaign that invites all Canadians to join in building a better country through giving. And let me please be very clear about the campaign's goal. My Giving Moment is not intended to solicit contributions from Canadians for the foundation or in any way tell people what they should do with their time, talent, or money. Rather, the purpose is to encourage Canadians to find their giving moment, their own giving moment, to give to good and worthy causes in whatever way is right and available to them in their own communities, according to their own time, and in their own way. It's based upon the notion that in a democratic society such as ours, we all have something to offer for the well-being of our communities and of our country, all of us. And that each one of us wants to do what we can to improve the lives of our neighbors, our fellow citizens. It's about raising awareness of the importance of giving and improving the climate for generosity in Canada. And so, my giving moment is intended to complement and to reinforce your efforts in the social profit sector, which in the end, community by community, will make our country better. I believe the Rideau Hall Foundation is a good example of both institutional innovation and collaboration amongst various sectors, public, <coughs> private, social profit. Already it has helped to bring into being new ideas and initiatives that would not otherwise have occurred or been possible and to allow this very traditional office that is rooted in the constitutional law country perhaps function more effectively to build that smarter, more caring nation about which we dream. As leaders within Canada's charitable sector, I know you're constantly thinking about and working on these kinds of collaborations, and I do know you're innovating. So my message to you today is keep going, continue to search out ways to form the creative connections and partnerships necessary for success in today's challenging and changing times. And let me stress the importance of defining success for your respective organizations and measuring results to track your progress. Improved measurement can enhance giving in two key respects. One, by improving the effectiveness of donations and gifts, and two, by reassuring those who give that their donation will be used to good effect. 
My great friend Hillary Pearson is over here. You all know Hillary well. Hillary has served on our advisory committee on philanthropy and volunteerism from the very beginning uh, when we started in Rideau Hall over three years ago. And from that committee came the idea of my giving moment and, in fact, the Rideau Hall Foundation to uh, strengthen the efforts of um, Rideau Hall. And this notion of measuring results in a disciplined way is a particular area that Hillary has worked on to help us in our efforts. Better measurement will lead to greater effectiveness for recipients and thus more confidence among donors. Remember that trust concept I referred to earlier. These two outcomes go hand in hand. And of course, the above applies to the overall goal of creating a more generous, caring Canada now and for the future. So let me close by offering two challenges for your consideration before we continue our conversation on leadership. One, can we define success and measure our progress towards strengthening the climate of giving in this country? Can we measure it? Can we define success? And two, can we seize the opportunity provided by Canada's 150th birthday in 2017 to encourage every Canadian to make his or her own gift to Canada? As leaders in Canada's social profit sector, each of you can make a real difference in shaping the future well-being of people in your communities and in this country. And let me leave you with my two favorite lines from Shaw that I was quoting last night at a marvelous theatrical production from disabled uh, young people. Some people see things as they are and wonder why. We dream of things that ought to be and ask why not. Thank you. Thank you.